invite you to pray with me once again this evening as we open this topic tonight. Help us, Jesus. Amen. 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 We'll talk about the Revelation's mark of the beast, and we want to kind of unfold that and unpack that tonight. When you talk about the mark of the beast, you know, many things come in people's mind, but probably the most prominent thing is the number 666. When you mention the mark, that's what people begin to think of. They, they think about it stamped on their head or someplace, you know, around. It's on their hand. It's, it's someplace. When you mention the mark of the beast, it invokes all kinds of emotions. People don't seem to know exactly what the Bible teaches, and they come up with all kinds of things in their minds. You know, they just conjure up these different ideas and thoughts about what the mark of the beast is and what it looks like. And so they all have these different images. And they wonder, what is the mark of the beast? Most people have the idea that Revelation, the book of Revelation, is largely about the mark of the beast. But they don't realize that Revelation is really not largely about the mark of the beast, but Revelation is mostly about Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It's the Lamb of God. It's Jesus himself who, who is the triumphant victor in this world. He's come to bring us back. He's come to take us to that better day and, and let us enjoy that better day and that better walk with Him. So whatever the mark of the beast is, we have to understand this. That it must have to do, as we look at the book of Revelation, we have to understand that the mark of the beast must have to do with this great controversy that we have talked about night by night and even this morning as well. The great controversy between good and evil. The great controversy between Christ and between Satan. This universal struggle between those two that began in heaven and it shifted to this earth. It must have something to do with something very, very significant. Or God would not have given us this very solemn warning not to receive this mark. If an entire chapter has been relegated and designated about the mark of the beast and devoted to it, then obviously it's extremely important to us. Would you agree tonight? Yes. But there seems to be that many people are confused about the mark. Some people wonder if it's the government identification number. You know, they think, well, it's your social security. It's something to do with that. It all plays together. And they begin to look at their social security cards. I know, I know there's some individuals, if it had 666 on that, they actually would send that back and try to get another social security number because I don't want that. I don't want that mark. Some people, if they get those on their credit cards, they send their credit cards back and say, I don't want that, you see. So it's, there's all kinds of things and thoughts conjured up about that. Do the numbers on our social security cards have something to do with the mark of the beast? Are people, there are people that are concerned with the barcodes that are out there today. I remember years ago when we started using barcodes to scan people's attendance, some people got upset about that. They said, oh no, I'm not going to give you that. I don't want that because that might be the mark of the beast, you see. But in reality, it's a very simple way to take attendance, isn't it? Yes. It just makes sense to do that. So you come in, you have a little thing, zoop, there it is. Some people think about that when they go to the grocery store. They look at all those barcodes, all those packages, and you know, you walk around there and, and they say, wait a minute, that must be it because people who have the mark of the beast, the Bible says, they're not going to be able to buy or sell. So it must have something to do with all of that. And they see the scanners and they say, yep, yeah, for sure enough. All of these electronic devices that sort of play into that, that must be it. That must have something to do with the mark of the beast. Other people say that we are actually headed for a cashless society. You know that, don't you? You've heard about that. And so the mark of the beast is a number on your credit card or your debit card or something to do with that because you have to have that mark in order to buy or sell. They believe one day we're not going to have any cash. And so you've got to have 666 to be able to buy or sell. So the question tonight is, who is this beast? The Bible says that no scripture is of any what? Private interpretation, right? That's in 1 Peter 20 and verses 21. 
So the mark isn't something that we need to guess about. It's not something that we need to wonder about. It's not something that we need to even conjure up ideas about what it is. The Bible says that the mark is going to be understandable for us. Why would God give us a mark unless he gave us some way to understand what that mark is? He gives us a solid warning not to receive the mark. Don't you believe that God would reveal what that mark is and make it so plain so that it could not be misunderstood? Otherwise, how would that be fair? You see, we worship a fair God, don't we? We worship a just God. We worship a God that loves us so much that He's trying to do all He can do to get us into the kingdom, not keep us out of the kingdom. Does that make sense? So obviously, He wants us to know what this mark is all about. The, the book of Revelation, it literally unfolds who this beast is. It identifies the mark of the beast, and it tells us how we can avoid receiving it. It answers our questions. Sometimes people ask the question, they say, is the beast a person? Is that a pretty good question? In fact, many people have thought that the beast was Adolf Hitler. You know, if you look at him, it was a, they say some, they've done some things with his name, and they say his name adds up to 666. There it is. He must be the beast power. He was a ruthless, murderous person that killed over 6,000 Jews in the Holocaust. Surely... He was the beast power. This must be the beast, they said. Others have thought that it might be some political leader alive today. You know, and, and they look at those around the world. Some have said they've looked at the past presidents and they've done some things with their names and they said, there it is, 666. They must be the beast power of Revelation. Others question and say, is the beast an organization? And if so... Is that beast power, political or religious, or is it both? So the question tonight is, how do you decide who the beast is and what the beast is and what does the beast do? How do you decipher that number 666 that people associate with the beast himself? How does the Bible explain the, the meaning of those questions? There is another question, and it's this. If there is a beast, and if the beast has a mark, how can I, how can you avoid receiving the mark of the beast, 666? How many want to know what that is tonight so you can avoid it? Raise your hand. Come on. What does it mean when the Bible says that the mark of the beast is in the forehead or in the right hand? The book of Revelation will clear it up for us. Because the book of Revelation is a revelation of whom? It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so as we study the mark of the beast, Jesus is revealing to us what he wants us to know and what he wants us to understand because Jesus wants us to be protected from that mark. Does that make sense tonight? That's why Jesus reveals those things to us. So just as the beast has a mark, a sign, or a symbol, Jesus also has a sign or a symbol. Jesus also has a seal. The book of Revelation does two things. It reveals error, and also it reveals truth, but it also exposes error. Does that make sense? So you have these two things that are there. He's telling us and showing us what error is, I mean what truth is, and he's exposing what error is because he wants to contrast the two so we can make intelligent decisions while we're upon this earth. Revelation talks about this struggle, this, this battle, this universal conflict that began in heaven and ends upon this earth between good and evil. And in this final battle between Christ and Satan, there is another struggle that's taking place, and that struggle is all about true worship and false worship. Who are we going to worship? Are we going to worship when and how and who God says, or are we going to trust in what man says and trust that instead of the Bible? The final crisis on this earth centers around God's, uh, God's seal and the beast's mark. So let's go directly to Revelation 13 and verse 1 and 2. John says, I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. This beast has seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head was a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. 
So the Bible describes this dreadful beast that comes up out of the sea. It talks about this beast power as being a mighty power, more than most of the other beasts that have been described. Now, Bible prophecy often uses symbols to describe world powers and events that take place. Remember the Chinese philosopher Confucius said, a picture is worth what? A thousand words. And so God gives us these word pictures so we can understand what God is trying to teach us and tell us. Why does he do this? Because what this does is it preserves his word, preserves it from the enemies who might want to destroy it and keep it from being revealed until it's supposed to be revealed. And so God writes in code. He writes in this code so at a time in the, in the fullness of time, I love that about God. The Bible talks about the fullness of time and the fullness of time. God always cooperates in the fullness of time. So at the right time, God says, I'm going to allow you now to have understanding and you're going to be able to decipher those codes that I have written in. I'm glad that he's done that for us, though, aren't you? Amen. So if these symbols condemn a political or religious power, what do you think the enemy would want to do? He would want to destroy those symbols if we knew what they were before their time. So God, in his mercy to us, cloaks them so we can understand it. The Bible says that this beast comes up from where? He comes up out of the sea. What does that mean? What's God trying to tell us? Well, we don't have to wonder. Revelation 17, we're going to review for a few moments here, okay? Is that right if we do that? I'm going to slow it down tonight. Can I do that with you? It's not going to be as fast as it was going this morning. Because this is very serious stuff we're talking about. We're talking about serious things at all times. But I want to tell you that, that, that this message is probably the most difficult message that I'm called to deliver. I'll talk more about that later. Revelation 17 and verse 15. The waters that you saw... Where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So water in Bible prophecy represents what? It represents people. And so when a beast comes up out of the sea, it comes up out of a populated area upon the earth. It comes up from amongst people areas. It comes up from amongst nations that exist at that particular time. So the Bible talks about this beast in Revelation 14, in Revelation 13, as being like four beasts. It's like a lion, it's like a bear, it's like a leopard, and it's like a dry, dragon. So what do these beasts represent? Daniel 7.23 tells us, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be what? The fourth kingdom on the earth. And so it's clear that the beast represents a kingdom. The beast represents a political power. Many people are misled and they believe that the beast is in fact a person, an evil person, a person that you can't trust, a person that is manipulative, a person that just works evil. But the Bible doesn't say the beast is that at all. The Bible says that this beast's power is a kingdom. It is a, a, a kingdom. And so when we think about it being as an evil person creating and doing mysterious, mischievous evil things, it's an improper interpretation of the scripture. The Bible says that these four beasts are four kingdoms. And so the beast represents a political or religious power in Bible prophecy. According to the Bible, what does the beast not represent? It does not represent a person. I want to make it very clear tonight. I've repeated myself several times because I want to be clear that the beast is not a person. We're not talking about people and persons tonight. We're talking about systems, organized systems of religion and worship and kingdom. So as the Bible describes this beast of Revelation 13, it goes on to say in verse 2, the dragon did what? The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. So whoever this beast power is, whoever this represents, he gets his authority from the seat of the dragon, right? Of the dragon-like beast. Isn't that what the scripture just told us? So if we can understand who this dragon-like beast is, 
then we can figure out who this dragon-like beast gave his seat of power and authority to, and we will know the beast power of Revelation. Isn't that correct? So let's go back to Daniel 7, and the Bible there talks about these kingdoms. It talks about a lion, and it says that the lion represents, the lion, this king of the beast, represents what? It represents Babylon. It talks about the bear, and what does it represent? It represents Media Persia. It talks about the leopard-like beast, and it represents Greece. And then it talks about pagan Rome, and pagan Rome is this dragon-like beast that gives its seat of authority and power to another power, okay? So it is this dragon-like beast of Rome that is represented by this in Bible prophecy. God uses animals to describe the nations. That sometimes shocks a, little, a few people, but, you know, it's not really unusual for us today because if I were to ask you what describes our political parties in the United States, what would you say? Or in the political season, what does an elephant represent? Well, it represents Republicans, right? What does a donkey represent? It represents the Democrats, right? And so if I were to say, what, what, what animal do you think of when we, when we think about America? You'd say it's an eagle. Isn't that right? What if I said England or Great Britain? What would you think about? It would be the lion. So it's not unusual at all, my friends. To understand that, that in Bible prophecy, God used these animals. Now, some of the mistakes that people make today is they try to take the, the animals that represent kingdoms today and apply them to Bible prophecy in Daniel's time. You can't do that because that's not what God says happens, you see. You can't take what the animal represents today and say, there it is. That's what, that's what God was talking about through Daniel, way back there in the book of Daniel. Because when you do that, you disjoint the whole prophecy and the other identifying marks don't fit that at all. And so it all has to flow and fit together. And so tonight, we're going to make it flow. We're going to make it fit together as we sort of unpack what the Bible teaches us. Does that make sense? All right. Here we go. So, Revelation 12 and verse 4. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Who was the child that was to be born that was going to rule all the nations? Who was that? That was baby Jesus, right? And so the Bible says that the dragon represents Satan. Revelation 12, Satan works through pagan Rome to destroy baby Jesus because who was the government in charge when baby Jesus was born? Remember what happened. It was a Roman official. It was Herod who passed the decree that he wanted to destroy all the male children under the age of two years old. And so, he wanted to do away with Jesus. It was a Roman governor, you remember, who sentenced Christ to death. It was a Roman executioner, you remember, who crucified Jesus. A Roman seal was put on the tomb of Jesus, and Roman soldiers guarded the tomb, my friend. And so, in the time of Jesus, Revelation 13 says this dragon, pagan Rome, would give a new power, its seat, and its authority, and its rulership, and its government. Who did pagan Rome give its power and throne and great authority to? There are six identifying characteristics that I want to look at this evening that describe this political and religious system that's mentioned in Revelation 13. Are you ready? The first clue that helps us to understand this power is to understand that this power, as we've talked about, received its seat of authority from, or from ancient pagan Rome. So let's go to one of the most learned professors in history. Professor LaBianca, he taught there at the University of Rome for many years. He made this observation. He said this, To the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to whom? To the pontiff. So, what does the Bible say? What did the dragon do? Because the dragon is pagan Rome, right? What did the dragon do? It gave who its seat of authority. It gave the pontiffs or the church of Rome its seat of authority, its seat and its power and what it was to rule with. 
So the Roman Empire, let's just review history for a few moments here. The Roman Empire was literally falling apart. It was crumbling. And Constantine recognized that very soon his empire was going to be overthrown by the Germanic invasions that were coming down from the north. Europe was being carved up by these invading armies, and it was being divided. So Constantine decided that he would move his capital from the city of Rome down to modern-day Turkey. And he created a new city, and that city was Constantinople, or it was known as the city of Constantine. Rather than leaving Rome vacant, what he did was he gave his seat of governmental authority to the popes of Rome. That's what happened. In fact, in Stanley's book of history, page 40, it says this. The popes filled the place of vacant emperors in Rome, inheriting their power, their titles, of their, type, their prestige and titles from paganism. The papacy is but a ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon its grave. And so tonight, we're going to look at some very clear teachings right from the Bible. The Bible makes the identification of the beast very, very plain. And it ver it's verified by history because that's how we know that the Bible is in fact real. Because we can look back and history reveals. This is what God said and this is what happened. In this presentation, in all that Jim and I say in every night, I want you to understand this. That it's not our intent to offend or hurt any person or group of people. That's not who we are. I want you to know tonight that there are many fine people in the Church of Rome, in the Catholic Church. They are committed Christians. They are Bible-believing Christians. The beast is not a person, my friend. The beast is a system of worship that is decided that its system is above God's system and God's rules and God's revelation that he outlined in Scripture. We are talking about a system of worship, not about people. Does that make sense to you? Yes. I say it again, it's one of the most difficult messages that we have been called to share with people around this world. What would happen was this. There would be a gradual compromise of the truth of God's Word that would come in through the church. We talked about that compromise this morning through what it did. It took us down, down, down through all of these teachings and then God would begin to build back through the Reformation and the truths that the, that the church began to take out. And those compromises would be accepted by the Christian church and by Protestant communions as well. They would accept those traditions in place of the very thus saith the Lord through his word. They would place traditions above sola scriptura, and scripture now took second place to the traditions. We're going to talk about some of those this evening. I want you to notice some clues here tonight. We're going to consider some facts of history, and then we're going to ask God, God, what do you want me to do with those facts? Is that fair enough? I, I feel so... I almost feel inadequate to share what I'm going to share with you. So I want to talk with Jesus once again. Can we do that? Father in heaven. Lord, sometimes you give us things that are such a challenge and we say, we feel so inadequate. And I would just pray right now that as we allow your scripture, your word, as we allow your word into our minds and into our hearts, that you'd help us to understand the truth as it is in Jesus. Father, we love you. We trust you. And we want to follow you. And I pray, Father, that the words that I speak will be received in which the spirit that they are delivered. So, may these words be soft and tender and compelling. But may they be truth like an arrow that penetrates every heart and every mind that needs to penetrate tonight. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
So, what would happen? Pagan Rome would receive its seat of government, and it would, it would give its seat of government to another power. Here's the second characteristic of this power in Revelation, the 13th chapter, and verse 8. Here it is. All who dwell upon the earth would worship him. And so, evidently, this power would become a worldwide religious political system that all the world would recognize. Does that make sense? Okay. The third thing is this. Revelation 13, 5 says... And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Now most of the time when we think about blasphemy, we think about somebody that curses God, right? But, but that's not, we think about somebody denying the very existence of God, but, but that's not what the Bible actually says blasphemy is. The Bible defines it for us. In Scripture, blasphemy occurs when an individual declares that he is God's equal or that he is above God and God has to honor what they say. God has now, he now assumes that the privileges and the authority that only God possesses. I'd be blaspheming if I told you that I am equal to God, wouldn't I? Or that God has to honor the decisions I make here upon this earth. That's blasphemy. And so this power evidently will claim to do that. Why is that blasphemy? Listen to me tonight. We've talked about it night by night, and that is, who is our only Savior? It's only Jesus. Who alone can forgive our sins? It's only Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. And so Hebrews 7.25 says this, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost to those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. And so, I don't have to go through an earthly priest, I, but here, what the Bible teaches us, the Bible says that, that we can only approach God through a priest. And we have a high priest. And that high priest is Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says, when we pray, you pray in my name. We, we come into the presence of God because of what Christ has done for us. Because of his sacrifice for us. We don't come to him now through some earthly priest. We have a high priest. Jesus is my intercessor. And listen to what the Bible says about blasphemy. Jesus was actually accused of being a blasphemer. Why? John 10, 33 says... The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself to be what? To be God. Why did the Jews want to stone Jesus? Because he claimed that he was God. Was Jesus God? Yes, yes he was, my friends. Jesus has all the rights. Jesus has all the authority. Jesus has all of the privilege. To forgive sins. That's who he is. He was not a blasphemer because his, he claimed to be equal with the Father. The Jews attempted to stone Jesus when Jesus claimed to be God. Does the Roman church make that claim? Let's see what they say. Here's the encyclical letter directly from the papacy, Leo XIII. And it says this. We hold upon this earth. What? The place of God Almighty. The history of the Roman church speaks for itself tonight. Look at another aspect of blasphemy. Mark 2, 7 says, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? The Bible says that Christ, they say that Christ is a blasphemer. Why? Because he claimed to be able to forgive sins. Can Jesus forgive sins? Yes. yes, he can, my friends. Why could he forgive sins? Because he is God. And he has the authority to do that. So not only is it not blasphemy because he claimed to be God, it's not blasphemy for him to claim to forgive sins because he is God. <coughs> Let's look at what the Roman church says that they have the ability to do. 
The Dignities and Duties of the Priest by Antonio Leguin. Each priest reads the book and they understand exactly what they are to do. It says this, and I quote for you, God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priests, either not to pardon or pardon, according as they refuse to give absolution. The sentence of the priest precedes and God subscribes to it. Does it sound like the priests are elevating themselves to a position not only equal with God, but to a position that God actually has to abide by. That's what it sounds like to me. Acts 4 and verse 12 says this, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there was no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. None except Jesus and Jesus alone. There is only one priest, and that is Jesus. There is only one person that stands before the throne of God as your high priest, and that is the man Christ Jesus himself. The theme of this book of Revelation, when it talks about the mark of the beast, it, it, it's not about some barcode, it's not about some scanners, it's not about some credit card, it's about the revelation of Jesus and what he wants us to know about the mark of the beast because Jesus is our only Savior and Jesus is our only Redeemer. Revelation is leading us back to this Jesus, not a man-made system of religion filled with human tradition. It's leading us back to Sola Scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone, so that we can stand firmly upon the Word of God because the enemy is about to unleash a wave of deception that we will be swept away with unless we stand upon God's Word. Does that make sense tonight? Yes. The third characteristic, they claim to be equal with God. And I say to you tonight, that is blasphemy. The fourth characteristic is found in Revelation 13 and verse 7. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So this power, this union of church and state, this, uh, this power that received its authority and its seat from pagan Rome, this power would rule through the period of what's known as the Dark Ages. This is when all Bible-believing Christians would be condemned to death because of their belief in the Bible and the Bible alone. This is when Christ took his church into the wilderness with the Walden Seas. Ask any church historian, and they will say this, they will tell you and answer the question, did the church and state unite under Rome and persecute those who did not go along with his teaching? The Western Watchman tells us in the 1908 edition, it says this, the church has persecuted only a tyro in church history will deny that. The word tyro means one that is uninformed. Only one that's uninformed in church history would believe that the church has not been a persecuting power. And this is very fascinating. And it comes from this public ecclesiastical law, page, volume 2, page 142. Watch what it says. It says the church, made by divine right, confiscate the property of heretics, imprison their person, and condemn them to the flames. So the church believed that the, the most heinous crime, the most serious crime that you could commit was heresy. Not to do what the church said to do. And therefore heresy can be punishable by inflicting civil punishments upon you. And that's according to their own documents. That's according to the church. So the Bible says this fourth power, this, the fourth characteristic of this power was going to be a persecuting power. And the Bible says that very plain that the issue that we're dealing with here is an issue about true worship. Not worship that flows out of fear, not worship that flows that I'm going to get some penalty if I don't do what you tell me to do. It's about worshiping God out of love. Does that make sense? God says, if you love me, and he opens his arms and he says, whosoever will, let them come. Remember what we read earlier, Revelation 13 and verse 5. And it was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue how long? 
42 months. Now, what's this all about? Apparently, it's about authority, right? Someone said that mathematics is an exact science. Now notice, I want to give you two mathematical proofs of the identity of the beast power here this evening. What about this, first of all, let's talk about this 40 and 2 months for a few moments. In Bible prophecy, one day equals a prophetic year. Okay? And we talked about that. I'm going to give you the text, Ezekiel 4, 6, and Numbers 14, 34. Ezekiel says, I'll give you each day for a year. And Numbers 14, 34 says, I have appointed a day for a year. And that's in Bible prophecy. And so what we're talking about here is 42 prophetic months. Now, in biblical times, there were not 31 days. There were 30 days in the Jewish calendar. And so we're talking about 42 months. Prophetic months, if there are 42 days in a prophetic month, that's 40 times, uh, 42 months and 30 days, that's 40 times 30, what does it come to? 1260 prophetic days, right? Or 1260 literal years. So the prophecy declares that this power who would receive its seat and authority from pagan Rome would have a time when it would rule without restraint for 1260 years and then something was going to happen to it the Bible says it was going to receive a deadly wound and so let's review for a moment there was Babylon, Media Persia Greece and then what? there was Rome and that Rome, pagan Rome would give its authority and its seat to this beast power and this power would rule for 1260 years and so the pagan empire began to fall apart and it was doing that from about A.D. Uh, 356 to about 476. And, and then after 476, it, 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 things were going on and, and there were wars that were taking place. And in exactly 538, the last of the tribes that were battling against this papal Rome, they were defeated. You remember what happened? This beast that, that rose up out of the sea, it had, it had ten horns. And, and what came up, up amongst those horns? It says another little horn, right? And, and that little horn was going to pluck up how many of those ten horns? It says it plucked up three of those horns. And so this power was going to have some resistance. And so from about 476 until 538, these three tribes resisted the authority of the popes, the Church of Rome. And they were warring and fighting and back and forth. But at, in 538, the last of them had, begin, had, be, had became defeated and totally eradicated. And those tribes were the Hurliali, the Ostagras, and the Vandals. You don't find a trace of them today because they were pulled up by its roots by this authority power. So the last tribe that was warring against papal Rome was defeated in 538. And so, the prophecy of this 1260 years begins in 538. So, if we, what happened? Well, Justinian, the Roman emperor, gave to the Pope of Rome his religious and his civil authority. The papacy was to last for 1260 years, and then the Bible says it's going to receive a deadly wound. That brings us down to the year of 1798. Did something significant happen to the Church of Rome in 1798? Who was the political leader in Europe at that time in France? It was none other than Napoleon. Napoleon looked to the south and he was troubled by what he saw in Rome. And so he was challenged by the Pope. And so there's something that took place. Napoleon says his general Berthier down to Rome and he took the Pope captive. He entered the city in 1798 exactly as the prophecy had predicted. He took the Pope captive and he brought him back to France and the Pope died in captivity in France. What does history tell us about this remarkable event that took place? Here's church history, page 24. The murder of a Frenchman in Rome in 1798 gave the French an excuse to occupy the eternal city putting an end to the papal temporal power. The aged pontiff himself was carried off into exile to Valencia. The enemies of the church rejoiced. The last pope, they declared, had resigned. In fact, 
he died. So just as Bible prophecy had predicted, a deadly wound was given to this power, and the Pope died in captivity in 1798. But what does the Bible say? Here it is in Revelation 13, 3. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled after the beast. The Bible says that it's going to rain for 1260 years from 538 to 1798, and it did. And then it says it was going to receive a deadly wound, and it did. The prophecy was fulfilled. And then the Bible says that sometime in the future, that wound was going to be healed. That power was going to receive its seat and its power and authority once again. Notice what happened in 1929. There was a meeting that took place in the San Francisco Chronicle. Chronicled it like this. It has this quote. It says, the Roman question tonight was a thing of the past and the Vatican was at peace with Italy. Mussolini, the Italian leader, and Gaspari, the, the, the Catholic cardinal, they signed a historic pact. And notice the language. The language, it says this, in affixing the autographs to the memorial document, healing the wound. Extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. So the Bible says that this deadly wound would be healed, and the San Francisco Chronicle uses exactly biblical language. It uses the language of God that says the deadly wound, it was healed. And the prophecy was filled exactly as God said it would. And so, around 1929, the deadly wound became healed, and the Catholic Church received its seat of authority and power once again. The Bible goes on to say in Revelation 13, 18. It says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is a number of a what? A man. Notice it doesn't say the beast is a man. What is the number? It is the number of a man. And his number is 666. Six, six. One of the official titles of the papacy is vicarious fiat dei, and it is a Latin phrase, and it is this: it means vicar of the Son of God or vice God upon the earth. The Scripture says, "Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, and is the number of a man. And his number is six six six. So." The number has to be linked to the head of the organization. The a number is part of the organization's title, the official title for this man that represents this beast power organization. The official title of the Pope, they wear many mitres, but one, one of his mitres is this official title that says, Vicarious Fiat Dei. It's a Roman power, so if it's a Roman power, what what value system would we use to apply or determine what that name would represent? Does it, in fact, add up to 666? I believe it's a Roman power. We shouldn't use the Roman numeral conversion chart. Would you agree? So let's look at it very quickly here because the Roman numerals have a value for each letter that is, has a value attached to it. And so if we take this value system and apply it to that, if you add up vicarious, it comes to 112. If you add up fi, it comes to 55. If you add di, it comes to 501. And if you add those three together, it comes to exactly 666. The number of the man. The title of the leader. So the power that God is revealing to us would be a power that would grow out of Rome and it would get its authority and its seat from, papacy, from, from pagan Rome. And the papacy did that. It would be a worldwide power of worship. The papacy is that today. The leaders would claim equality with God. We read some texts. Do they do that, my friends? Yes, they do. They claim the ability to forgive sin. The Roman church uses priests and prelates to do exactly what God said was blasphemy. 
This power would be a persecuting power. And that's exactly what the church did during that 1260 years of the Dark Ages. There are estimates that say over 50 million believers were put to death during those 1260 years. That's a lot of people. It would be a power that would reign for 1260 years. And then it would receive a deadly wound. And that's exactly what happened to the papacy. The prophecy of God has been fulfilled as no other prophecy has been. As this prophecy could fit no other individual, no other system of worship, no other power that's been upon the earth. Because it would be a, a, a power that was going to rise up from pagan Rome. It only fits, my friends, to discover the power that pagan Rome gave its seat to. And this exalted name, the total, 666. The Bible says in Revelation 13, verses 6 and 7, 16 and 17, he says he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their foreheads or on their, fore, on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one might buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So that leads us to the question, what is this mark of this power, of this beast power that God has revealed to us tonight? Whatever the mark is, we have to understand that it is the opposite of God's sign. It would be in competition with what God has revealed. It would be, my friends, a counterfeit of what God has revealed to us in Scripture. We're talking about an organization that arises that has a mark of its authority and claims that mark as its authority. For every counterfeit, there is a genuine. For everything false, there is something true. And so the, art, the opposite of the mark, the mark of the beast must be God's sign or God's seal. Does that make sense? So, so to understand what the mark of the beast is, we must first understand what God's sign is or what God's seal is. So this, this topic is of such enormous importance. That's why I've got to slow it down and take a little more time here this evening with this because... It needs to be plain. It needs to be understandable. Wouldn't you agree tonight? Amen. So let's just see what this has to deal with. We've got to understand what God's seal is. Revelation 7, verses 2 and 3 puts it this way. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east. And what does he have? He has the seal of the living God. On one hand, we have the mark of the beast. And on the other hand... We have the seal of the living God. And this angel cries with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, nor the trees until we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. Notice that the mark of the beast can be received in the forehead or in the hand. But God's people only receive His seal in their foreheads. What's the difference, my friends? The mark of the beast in the forehead means that people have been deceived by what the beast has taught them. Because the forehead is where we make our decisions. The forehead is where we can be fooled. The forehead is, is where we have our cognitive thoughts take place. The forehead is where we can choose the beast way over God's way. There have been people who have been misled and they have accepted falsehoods rather than truth. The mark of the beast in the hand indicates that sometimes when we, you know, if you have, you know, when you exert strength, when people take charge of some people, when they will grab them and make them do something, the hands can force you to do something against your will if they're strong enough to do that. Isn't that so? And so this power either deceives us or it forces people to do something against their will, even if they don't agree that that might be the truth. Even if they don't believe it. But they're going to yield to the pressure. The pressure that was exerted for even 1260 years to bend to what the church was teaching them. So, maybe they've been coerced. 
Aren't you glad that God never forces us? That God just opens up and says, here I am, I want to reveal myself to you. And I want to embrace you. I want to, encamp in, in, I want to just hold on to you so close and love you. But the enemy of God, he will do anything to make you and force you do, to do what he wants you to do. But God says, whosoever will. So God's people only receive his seal in our minds. God never forces us to do anything. We accept God's sign freely and openly. Now, what does the Bible mean by a sign or a seal? Romans 4.11 says, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness. So in the Bible, a sign and a seal is the same thing. So we have to ask ourselves tonight, where is God's seal found? It's found in God's legal documents, and that's the Ten Commandments. Isaiah 8.16 says this, Seal the law among my disciples. What is God's seal? What is God's sign to us tonight? Ezekiel says, in the 20th chapter and verse 12, Moreover, I also gave them my what? My Sabbaths to be a what? A sign between me and them. God's sign of loyalty is the seventh day Sabbath that exalts God as our creator and our maker of heaven and earth. Amen. The Sabbath is God's sign. The Sabbath is God's seal. The Sabbath symbolizes the worship of God because he is the one who created us. He is the one who is worthy of our worship. Does that make sense tonight? You see, it's got to make sense. I say if this doesn't make sense to you, just forget it. But if it does make sense to you, don't let anyone or anything keep you from making this part of your life and part of your walk with God. It reveals our allegiance to our Creator. 666 is just the opposite of this, my friends. It indicates a rebellion in changing God's law and in changing his seal. Now there is something else about a seal that is very significant. Every seal makes a document legal. A seal authenticates a document itself. Every seal has three elements. It has the name of the one sealing, it has the title of the one sealing, and it has the domain of the one sealing. For example, if you wanted to see the seal of the President of the United States, maybe Abraham Lincoln, you would say, it would say Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States. Every seal authenticates the document to make it legal. What does every seal have? It has the authority, right? What authority does he have to do that? What territory does he preside over? So God, in fact, has a seal that contains three things that make the documents legal itself. In Exodus 20 and verse 8, let's look at this. It says, remember the Sabbath day to do what? Amen. Keep it holy. For in six days the Lord made have the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. And then what did he do? He rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and he hallowed it. In the heart of God's law, in the heart of God's commandments. Here, the Sabbath commandment, it literally authenticates the entire Ten Commandments. When the commandments say, thou shalt not kill, you can say, why shouldn't I kill? Thou shalt not steal, why shouldn't I steal? What do you mean I can't do that? The Lord, that's His name. The Maker, the Creator, that's his title, my friends. The creator of heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. That's his domain. So the Sabbath commandment contains God's name. It contains his title. It contains his territory. The Ten Commandments are sealed by the very Fourth Commandment law that makes it binding upon all human beings because God is our creator. He has sealed it with his Sabbath commandment. That's why God says in Ezekiel 20.20, 20, Hallow my Sabbath, they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. The Sabbath.
Sabbath is God's sign of loyalty and faithfulness to our Creator God. The Sabbath literally is God's seal. It's His symbol that we may know that He is Lord. Not just King of Kings, but He is Lord of Lord of our lives. He's our Creator and we worship Him. The central issue regarding the mark of the beast is worship. Who are you going to worship? The issue are, is true worship on one hand and false worship on the other. Notice how the Bible describes this in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. It says that I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having an everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And do what? Worship Him. Who did what? Who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. Here is a call to back to worshiping our Creator God. It's a call to true worship. The issue is over worship, my friends. Revelation 14, 9 and 10 says, Now watch this. Then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man does what? Worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, what's going to happen? He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Revelation 14, 12. We've read it many times. It's so important. When you repeat something, it's important for us to understand that. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so let's summarize this. God is calling us to true worship. Worshiping our Creator. Revelation 14, 9 is a warning against false worship and a false system. Revelation 14, 12 represents those who are the true followers of God. And what are they doing? God's going to have a people, my friends, who will worship Him as Creator by keeping all of His commandments because His commandments are a sign. His commandments are a seal. The commandments authenticate. The fourth commandment authenticates all of the other commandments. If the Sabbath is a sign of worshiping our Creator, what is the beast sign? Or what mark does the beast have? What does the Roman Catholic Church claim as its sign of its authority? I believe it's only fair to go to what they say, don't you? I'll tell you, if you want to know what a Baptist teaches, don't come to me, because I'm not a Baptist any longer. I think we ought to go to the Baptist stuff if you want to know what they teach. So if you want to understand what the Catholic teach, I'm not going to tell you what I believe they teach. I'm going to go to their documents and reveal, just as we've done tonight, what do they say themselves? Because that's what's important, isn't it? So what do the Catholics say is their sign or their mark of authority. The Catholic record, September 1, 1923. The church says, Sunday is our what? Our mark of authority. Watch this. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you that you can go to the library, you can go online, you can Google some of these things, and you can look it up yourself. I'm going to give you a handout with some of these references tonight. They're clear historical references. I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just sharing with you what God wants us to know and understand. What he said to us on how we're going to understand who and what the beast power is and what the beast's mark of authority is in this world. God's seal is his Sabbath. The Roman church claims that its mark of authority is worship on the first day of the week, and that is Sunday. Here's a statement from St. Catherine's Church. Notice this, from May 21, 1995. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happen in the first century. The Holy Day Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Not from any direction noted in Scripture, but from the church's sense of its own power. Watch this now. People who think that the Scriptures 
should be its sole authority. People who want to stand on sola scriptura like the reformers did and brought about the reformation. Here's what they say. You should logically become Seventh-day Adventist and keep Saturday holy. That's from the Roman Catholic Church. It's amazing. Right from the rectory. Now, let's make it plain tonight, my friends. What about Bible-believing Christians who are keeping the first day of the week? Do they have the mark of the beast? The answer is no. Did you hear me tonight? The answer is no, they do not. There are many Bible-believing, Christ-accepting, walking with Jesus people in all faiths that are around this world today. What's happening is they don't understand the central issues that we've been sharing here and that we're sharing tonight and in subsequent nights. But when they do, God has a message for them. And God says, come out of that confusion. Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her plagues and of her sins. And so God is moving, and thousands, thousands of people around the world are hearing messages just like this. Because the beast power of Revelation is a worldwide power. God says, I'm going to have a message. That's going to counterbalance that power around the world. So we as a church preach this in over 208 nations around this world tonight. It's an incredible message that's going forth, my friend. The issues that we're talking about in this series. People do not have the mark of the beast now because they worship on Sunday. Not at all, my friends. They just don't understand clearly some of the things that many of you understand here tonight and some of you are learning for the very first time. There is a system that God wants us to understand that has changed God's law. Uh, let me rephrase that. I'm going to go back to Daniel's words. Who has thought to change God's law from Sabbath to Sunday? You may think you've changed times and laws, but you don't. Amen. You don't. You may represent that as being factual and truthful, but it is not. I heard one country preacher. He says, a dog has four legs and a tail. You can say his tail is a leg, but he still has four legs. You can say Sunday is the Sabbath, but it is not Sabbath. Uh, last year in March or April, you're familiar with Wake Forest, the Baptist Seminary? You, you know Wake Forest, don't you? <laughs> Pretty close, isn't it? Do you know they had a two day symposium on Sabbath keeping? Incredible. Incredible. They had a presenter that talked about the value of Sabbath, the importance of Sabbath. They had a presenter that talked about keeping the commandments of God. And, and, and I read, I read the excerpts. I, I, and it's all mine. And so while I was reading that, I was thinking to myself, man, that sounds like Jim could have delivered that message. You see. They had it all right down the line, Jim. The purpose and why and the enjoyment and the creation and all of that. The trouble is, they were just 24 hours late. Just 24 hours late. So they applied all of the understanding about Sabbath. They applied that to the first day of the week instead of the seventh day. Now I want to tell you, when, when evangelicals and Sunday people start talking about keeping the Sabbath and the commandments of God, I say hallelujah. Even if they apply it 24 hours late because that just means they stopped saying that the commandments have been done away with. Because that's what they've taught for years. Now they say they've not been done away with, and we ought to keep them. Because God's not a restricted God. God is a he, He's given us those commandments not to keep us from doing bad things, but to keep bad things from happening to us. They're, they're protective. <laughs> Incredible things. 
So I, I'm just rejoicing in that because it makes it a lot easier to come along now and really share what God reveals in the scripture about what day is Sabbath. It is not Sunday. It is Saturday. Let's be clear about that tonight, my friends. It has not been changed. But the folks that are keeping Sunday don't understand that there's a church system that has placed itself above the very authority and placed tradition above God's Word in the Bible. Before Jesus comes back, He says, I'm going to set the record straight. Yes. And I'm going to give you the messages and have you to have this understanding that's going to allow you to take those extra steps up the Reformation ladder because God is coming back for His church just like He left it. It's called the Apostolic Church. And it's going to have all the teachings that Jesus left in the church when He ascended into the clouds. And it was a Sabbath believing, keeping church. I want to be part of that church. What about you? Amen. And so, God is using this time, my friends, to reveal to those who are hungry and thirsty, to reveal to them what's he, what He wants us to understand. I've got some more stuff, but I'm going to shut it down. I'm going to close it up, Jim. Because I think it's clear to of what's happening. God is calling us to take a stand. God is calling us to be faithful. God is calling us to trust Him because He has revealed not only in His Word. I want to tell you that Jesus has revealed in my life that I can trust Him. I'm going to close with this. I remember when I first heard this message, I was a Baptist and I'd been studying and I had some questions about the topic Jim shared about what happens when you die. I had some questions about this Sabbath. And I, I just had issues and questions and so I, I went to one of the Baptist deacons and he knew his Bible from, from cover to cover. I mean, if you started the Bible text, he could finish it and he'd tell you where it was. So I went by his office one day. He, was, he worked for the post office. And I said, hey, Brother Pitts, I need to talk to you. So I, I, we, we took some time, sat down, we talked together. And I asked him some of these questions about Sabbath and other things. And he looked at me and he said, Glenn, those things don't really matter. And I said, really? He said, yeah, they don't really matter. And I said, you know, Brother Pitts, you could have said almost anything to me. You could have said, I don't understand it. That's a mystery. Uh, I'm really not interested in that. <laughs> I'm happy doing what I'm doing. I said, I believe God only inspired so many words from Genesis to Revelation. I believe all of those words matter. Yeah. All of them matter. <laughs> that was the beginning of the end of my Baptist experience. So I continued to read and pray and study. We weren't going to church. And I, I, I was in business. I was a car dealer. There I said it. I had a used car lot. <laughs> Not only used car sales, but I had a used car dealership. Can you believe that? Let me just tell you this out front. You can't be a Bible-believing, Christian Jesus-accepting car dealer and be honest. You can't be. Okay. It's hard, but you can be. So... I came home from my office one day and I picked up the newspaper. And there in the newspaper, right there in Ocala, Florida, there was an ad in that paper about these meetings that were going on down here in the little old church. And the meeting that night was on the topic I'm sharing with you tonight. The Mark of the Beats. Okay. The first time I ever put my foot <laughs> in a Seventh-day Adventist church preacher was preaching on this topic. And as I sat there just like you all, and I heard it, it was like I, I was in a tunnel. And there was a light, bang. And there's another light, bang. There's another light, bang. And it just, as I said to you, it's got to make sense. So if it doesn't make sense, don't do it. But if it does make sense, don't let anything stop. It made sense. 
And so after the meeting, Jim, I'm going to take up a little more of your time, but you forgive me. See, when you get out later past nine, blame Jim, don't blame me, because he's the last one preaching. That's what happens when you preach last. And so, <laughs> and so you're welcome. It, it's my gift. I, I just, I'm one that just keeps on giving. So where was I? Help me out. Oh yeah, got to make sense. So after the meeting, I was greeting and we're talking and I walked out the door and the pastor and the evangelist are there. So I said, hey, I need to talk to you guys. They said, oh, okay, let's make an appointment. We'll talk to you this week. I said, uh, no, I need to talk tonight. <laughs> Because that's just kind of the way I am. So they said, okay. So we stood there in the lobby of the church, and we talked till almost 11 o'clock. Poor old evangelist's eyes. They were just weak. They were almost shut, just little slits. The pastor's leaning up against the door, you know. So they said, no, we got to go. <laughs> so this was so long ago. This is 1976. And so... He was selling his sermons, not copies, but they were the mimeograph. You remember? He used to type them on that little blue thing and put them on that roller. So he was selling those sermons for a quarter apiece. There were 12 of them up to that night. I bought every sermon. Man, I busted the back. So I took those sermons home, and I read every single one of those sermons that night. I looked up every Bible text that night, Wednesday night. Went to work Thursday. <laughs> Friday came, I reached into my desk, and I pulled out a piece of paper. I took a black magic marker, and I wrote, Close Saturday. I put it on the front door. I called the guys that worked before me and I said, listen, we're going to be closed tomorrow. They said, hallelujah, we get a day off. I said, listen, we're going to be closed every Saturday. Okay. Oh, crazy. They thought I was nuts. I'm serious. They thought you are nuts, man. You can't be in the car business. Do you know what Saturday was? It's a big day to sell cars. I might sell three or four cars. I might make, well, I'm not going to tell you how much. I want you to know this. I was in church that next Sabbath. And I've been a Sabbath keeper ever since. Ever since. Now, all of my friends said I was going to go bankrupt. And I would tell them, I said, look, I don't know what God has in mind for me, but I know what he has in mind for the place that he owns. Because that's his place down there. He doesn't want that place to be open on Saturday, the Lord's Day. Here's what the Lord did. The Lord prospered us more in five days than he did in six. Than he did in six. I want to tell you, when you step out, God will step up. Let me pray. Father, I just have one word to you tonight. 